And the following apologies that we've got Bill, Heath, Lisa, any others? No. Well, we should note Mike. Mike, Mike, come on. Oh, Lisa, hello, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Okay. I'll make that those apologies be received. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, let me let me move around a second. Okay, I'll see that. Right, are there any uh, declarations of conflicts of interest over and above what is known? I use mine now. Hold up. Not for me, no. No, okay. Now there's no matters lying on the table. I'll move that the confirmation, the confirmation of the agenda is uh, being circulated. Second. Your second, lovely. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Gary, thank you. We'll move next to the risk and compliance update. So Gareth. Okay. So just by way of introduction, yes. um, you've seen Gareth at the table before. He was the, he was our PMO director, right? And through the, um, the workforce review that we undertaken, um, Gareth has applied for and has been successfully installed in the position of risk and compliance manager. He's got a very strong um, CV in that area, and luckily in the Energy sector in Australia. So we're very pleased to have Gareth on board in that role. So Same. here he is with his first report. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, I'm happy to take the report as read. Um, in saying that, it is a fairly lengthy report. So it would be useful. I'm also happy to take you through the main elements and obviously happy to respond to any questions that you have. Okay. That would be good. I think it'd be useful to be there. Okay, great. So, um, so the report is um, an update on uh, the risk function um, and implementation of a CEO risk management culture at QLBC. Um, the committee, obviously, previous members have heard um, around um, our maturity in the risk management space and where we're heading over numerous years. Um, and it's a continued journey for us. And this report covers off uh, a number of elements. So um, it covers off uh, changes to the organisational risk register. So I'll touch on that very quickly. Um, significant changes to the council risk context is covered off in the report as well. Um, there is uh, an overview of what we're doing currently in terms of the risk culture development. Um, our key treatment processes for the uh, risks that are front of mind at the moment, um, and then it, uh, it also includes uh, some minor updates to our risk management policy. Um, and what the report is seeking uh, from you today is to note the content of the report firstly, um, and then also recommend the proposed changes uh, to the policy to council, um, and that's consistent with your terms of reference. Okay, thank you. So I've got um, Bill Moran couldn't be here, he's an apology, but he has some questions, which I'll uh, raise. So on the three lines of defence, 34, a couple of questions. Is the third line AR, AFRC too narrow in focus? Shouldn't it be the QLDC Council of External Audit Review where required? And in terms of the separation of roles between the first and second lines of defence, is this supported by appropriate policies, particularly by clear the A's. So happy to cover off both of yes. those. Um, probably easiest, I'm just trying to find the page number for you to help 11. you in terms of, oh, there we go, 11. 11, well done. Three lines of defence. So there is a, a model that's in there. Um, yes. The first thing to say is that we've just started the process of talking about what three lines of defence means for us as an organisation. So um, we're not asking for approval at this point in time of any model. It's just flagging that there is a model. It is growing in its use. So um, it's a work in progress. It is a work in progress, yes. yes. Um, so I suppose the reporting lines haven't been defined yet. Um, okay. They're intended as being indicative. Um, certainly from previous experience, um, Internal audit usually reported through to the uh, the equivalent of an audit finance and risk committee. Um, it would not be unusual, however, for the committee to make a decision that that needed to be considered by uh, a board or, in our case, the whole of council. 
Um, so in most models, certainly from my experience, it does reference that this normally goes through to an audit committee. So that's not inconsistent with standard practice, um, but very happy to take direction in terms of what that needs to look like. Thank okay. you. Um, and then in terms of the second line of defence and the first line of defence. Um, so from a initial review of where we are at, our strategy and policy team have uh, have done a review of our existing policies. Um, so that's only recently been uh, completed. Um, we don't, at this point in time, have a defined second line function, what that means for us as an organisation. So that is a journey that we need to go on. Um, we also need to uh, develop our maturity around what it means if you write a policy in terms of how it's implemented across the council. That's not to say that we're doing that poorly at the moment, but we don't have anybody in the risk of compliance space that's defined their respective roles and responsibilities for them at this stage. Okay. Yes, can I just follow on from your question, um, Stu? Um, and in terms of the role of our external auditors and how are, are they, uh, does this model envisage a more active relationship with those external orders on an ongoing basis or are they simply there as a as a sort of a, a an annual or a irregular sort of check on what the organization is performing how the organization is performing so that's a, a really good question um, and in any three long defense model and that includes the external uh, audit component as well there needs to be some uh, interrelationship between each of the levels of assurance um, that's normally a risk-based approach um, and the external auditor would normally want to see the reports that have been provided by the internal audit function to understand the risks. Yep. Um, so there needs to be that relationship, but it also needs to be independent. So external audit tends to choose its own approach in terms of making its own decision on risks, but it is guided by the other three lines. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Mike. Yep. And I suppose there's an expectation on our external as I Deloitte that they will be proactive in that space in terms of um, seeking those those reviews when they think there's a timely need to do so. Yeah, from is that part of our sorry, oh, sorry, is that part of our commercial relationship with them, isn't it? Yeah, through you, yeah, Mr. Chair. The, although the external audit's placed on the right of the diagram, they're actually active on all three lines of, of yeah. defence. So it's part of their mandate is on a risk base um, on a risk base approach to test our management controls or internal controls look at our policies and basically just you know, maintain or over, oversee um, the, the general risk management practices um, to see that they're appropriate and uh, that's part of their their annual process but yeah. they do pick they do have areas of emphasis each year that they will focus on. Yeah. The economy and order to general. Correct. Yes. That fell up there. Yeah, that fell up there. Thank you. Yeah, just, just on that, Chair Chair. Um, I'm not sure what Bill's position was on that, but I, I had a look at the model and, and it was pretty clear that it was a broad model that would be adapted for a particular organisation and, and that there were different ways that that could be done. Um, I'm concerned to see that full council as a part of that model. Um, definitely all the plans and risk needs to be part of it. I'm not sure where it should sit, whether it should be part of an internal audit in, in a sense and whether full council needs to be across. But I would like to see a workshop um, with, with the council, full council, to see where they see function in this because ultimately this will need to be signed off assisted by full council. Um, I'm thinking that it's up for them this committee. So I'm happy to respond to that chair. Yes. You'd like me to respond to the yes. process of implementing um, the three lines of defence model. So um, as per the term of the reference of the AFR, any changes to the uh, risk management policy need to come to AFR. Um, but they then need to be recommended on to council uh, for council to uh, adopt the policy. Um, so it would be usual practice for your three lines of defence model to be outlined the roles and responsibilities outlined in the risk management policy. 
So that policy, yes, absolutely, would go to full council full recommendations. With a recommendation. With a recommendation. Yeah. I guess I'm just suggesting that would be helpful to, to workshop that with councillors so that they understand the principles behind the model and, and therefore how it could be best adapted for this particular organisation. The other question I had was around the internal audit and how we ensure that's independent. So when I when I read it up on the model, it, it looked as though that needed to be clearly independent of the rest of the organisation. It, it in quotes, you know, it meant that that internal audit was the eye and ears of the governing body, which presumably is the council, and that the the head of that audit function would actually be potentially employed separately by the governing body other than management. So there was a there was a clear need for independence as I read it in the model. So I'm just interested in how that works in this organization. So that we so that there is clear objective risk reporting to governance. I'm happy to respond to that briefly yeah. as well. Um, so the three lines of the model is hugely uh, developed to reflect the needs of the organisation. Um, and you're right, in certain organisations, certainly listed companies will uh, often have a role who oversees independent audit that reports through a management line separate from a risk and compliance function. It, um, most companies aren't involved in it. It's an external party that does them. Very few have their own internal audit function now. And in local government, um, I suppose understanding that independence role is really important for us um, and making sure that there's a clear line uh, between those that are doing the second line and first line functions and those doing the third line is, is really important. It's not unusual because of capacity and capability and understanding the organisation to have combined risk and uh, in internal audit functions so other councils have that and I suppose system processes need to be put in place to maintain that independence. Um, for example, it wouldn't be appropriate for me in an internal audit role to audit the effectiveness of risk management policy because that would be um, I suppose not uh, having clear independence. It would possibly be appropriate to look at a procurement policy, a policy related to health and safety, um, other policies that the organisation might have that I have no uh, involvement in on a day to day basis. Yeah. Mm. It really comes down to whether there's enough work for a full time person internally or whether you contract it out. So that's the yeah, I think we also need to remind ourselves that, uh, unlike uh, a lot of other businesses, which we do have the Office of the Auditor General, we do have yes. that external yes. body that we yes. are accountable to, and yes. we do have appointed external auditors yes. that provide that. Uh, you know, a, a completely at arm's length um, um, review of our performance uh, in ways that other businesses don't have. Um, and then you also have independence on this. And, and on this as well. As well. Yeah. Mr. Chair, just on that, the, I thought, I'm going to put a report way back that you have uh, one, like you, I think you alluded to it, so you might have internally one department, first one department might order for someone. From, uh, another area with internal, so you're not not external people. So you might have someone from on on certain functions just to go in and order the following the right procedure. Does that still happen or not? Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I thought we used to do that years ago. So through you, Chair, happy to respond to that. Um, so at the moment, we have a number of different internal audit functions happening, um, and they're different in different parts of the organisation. So. Uh, I don't know, project space we have independence. So uh, the PMO has an independent uh, person to come in and review um, what's happening in that space. It's an internal person, but someone that's not involved in delivery. Um, in other cases, we have an internal audit function that's provided by an external auditor, uh, similar to the model that you raised earlier, yes. uh, building consent, for example, because of the risk of that. So it's a mixed model, and I think a mixed model is the right model. It's about managing risk, making sure that you have capability on the people doing the audit. That's the key to it, it's the capability of the um, people. Yep. I think that the, the building consent uh, model is a is a important model where we do get completely independent risk analysis, but also in areas like uh, the environmental health area, we're independently audited by them on a regular basis as well. So 
there's a large number of externals that do undertake auditing of the organisation. It's really in the confined space that we need to grow <clears throat> as an organisation in order to ensure that we are uh, carrying out what we need to do to the level that we need to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's a space that really needs to be developed. And obviously, uh, Gareth on his own can't do that, so we're going to need some assistance, some additional resource in that space. But it is provided for, it's just not deployed as yet. Thank you, Stuart. Just another couple of quickies from uh, Bill. It's under 6.2 in here in Brist. The range is from likely 2 to 25% and rear north to 2. Seem a bit mechanical. If they're based on a standard model, fine, but 5 to 25 and north to 5 may be more practical. That's just a uh, comment, Bill. Oh, so we won't debate it, just for you to think about. Yeah, and yeah. just in response to that, yes. um, what we're proposing today is some minor changes to our risk management policy. Yes. Um, we have a work plan that's proposed and it's in there for uh, committee members to consider, which talks about a more full and complete review of the risk management policy. So um, happy to take uh, those comments and consider them through that process, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Yes, Sorry, it was a long report. I do have a couple more questions if that's possible. Look, just, just related to the um the internal order and, and just looking at the it's not an order, but just the assessment of risk that we've just got in front of us and some of the key risks. Um I just worry that they are sometimes presented in a very positive light and that we don't necessarily get um when something isn't going quite right, that it isn't necessarily brought to the table and highlighted. In a public forum, and I, and I think in a lot of ways that that would help public trust. Um, just looking at um, ineffective management of social and nuisance issues, I, I know there, there's obviously been some media recently around CCTV and the waterways function, and so there is there is some risk I think in that space at the moment. Um, looking at zero zero four two ineffective councillor induction, um, the induction was great generally, but there's some key areas where councillors are still not up to speed on strategic projects. To the extent that the past council was. So we have had two workshops on um, Manawa. We still don't have in front of the new councillors the costs and the risks that we were made aware of last May. So in terms of um, there is a risk in there around failure to inform councillors. There are some of these risks that I can see, you know, internally, uh, but everything that's presented is positive. So if I'm thinking about an internal audit function and perhaps your team doing that, having, I need some assurance that we're going to get objective reporting and when things aren't going so well, that that's going to come to us as well, because it's very important, I think, that the councillors are made aware of risk. Um, it has a massive impact on decision making. So, you know, personally, I like to see the downside of things as well as the upside of things. Um, and just on that, Policy because it looks like we're just about to agree it. You're about to move it. I'm about Great to move it. it. I'm about to move it. Um, I think it would be valuable to, to go through this and, and do a policy review. I just had a look under the chief exec leadership team, for example. You've got the following roles and responsibilities. Sorry, this is on page five. Um, the following roles and responsibilities of the chief executive team may be delegated, um, and they're actually different from the roles and responsibilities of the executive leadership team above. Um, provide assurance that strategic risk being appropriately managed, um, you know, should that be more objective? Because that, again, is a, is a positive statement. Um, should it be ensure that strategic risks are being appropriately managed? And if you're going to report, it needs to be objective. I'm just, so I think you look, this is this is not bad, but I, I would like to see a, a review of the policy if that's what you're thinking and what you go through it in some way. But if it's not uh, working, words aren't going to change that. So. No, no, correct. Um, but it's just that the intent behind the words and the culture that sits behind the way this some of the words are framed or the actions are framed. Yeah. So um anyway, thank you. That's what I'm okay. And happy to move. Okay, happy to move. I won't say anything then, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just going to provide some clarity for you, Chair, if yes. this would be useful. Um, as I said, this, this is some immediate changes just to cover off some things that have been identified as being inconsistent with the way that we run our mental risk management 
uh, framework at the moment. Um, as I said earlier, there is intended in this outline of the paper to do a complete review of, uh, of the policy, and obviously uh, that will require a lot more uh, engagement yeah. from this team and others. Um, I'll just say some of the areas I can't comment on the specifics, um, but the three line defense model is a really useful tool for understanding what assurance looks like and who has what role and accountability through that process. Um, so I think that'd be really important for us to understand what it looks like um, for QLBC, um, and I think that might cover off some of your concerns. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, that was, um, was Jeff. Um, this yeah, it's obviously a pretty extensive policy, but and that's what we're getting to. Down the working level, there's a you know, who actually reads all this, uh, and how do you at, at the working level? Are there checklists or just simple things to guide the uh, the management and the uh, work of the you know, project officers all the way all the way down, or have they got to have this sitting on the desk? So uh, well, just this compliance framework type thing you're working on, uh, how it works at the working level. Yes, through, through you, Chair. Um, uh, that's part of the review that we're doing at the moment. Obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our uh, strategy and policy team has done a review of all of our policies. Um, understanding the format of those, how they're implemented across the business is a really important function of that second line of defence that's proposed in a three line of defence model. Oh, okay. You're right though, um, from a risk management perspective, absolutely. Part of the work that I've been doing is workshops um, across the business. Um, I think I've run probably 20 of those now. Um, and they're partly around uh, refreshing understanding around what the risk management policy requires of us and giving those teams some tools so that they can actually um, essentially implement the policy in a way that makes sense for them. So you're right, a policy on the shelf is not very helpful without that additional work that we're going through and doing now. It's going to become part of the culture of the organisation where people understand it, they know when to escalate and put their hands up. Yep. So that's all which which goes back to one of the reasons why as the organisations grow and become more complex that we're we specifically introduce these roles to give us that capacity. Yep. Okay. So we've got a mover and I'll second. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. you for the good work and uh, look forward to coming back again at some stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, move to page 35. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> part of that resolution is $900. That needs to be um, required in the sense of expenditure policy. So, an amendment out of it that was $900 as required on my notes. Yep. Sorry, $900. Right? <laughs> no, so I'm sorry. You. The resolutions, yep. uh, the recommendations one, to note the contents of this report, and two, recommend to council the proposed amendments to the risk management policy, $900 as required in the sensitive expenditure policy. Yes. So I hit that mark and I forgot to do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're happy to be yeah. happy. Thank you. Okay. Right, so we move to page 36. Ninth of March version. It's not in my original. Um, no, there was an updated. I don't know how it's got or what it pertains to. Niall, can you comment to that? Changes between the 9th and the 14th? Um, apologies, no, I, I can't see it in my version either. Um, so on the 14th version, there's nothing referencing sensitive expenditure. I'm assuming that may have somehow appeared from another report. Yeah. Council the proposed amendments. Oh, okay. Right, we'll take that back. Yeah. I don't think any of us know where that's coming from. We didn't vote on that. We voted on one. We'll just save $900. Yeah. <laughs> right, Petty, welcome. Morning all. Uh, <clears throat> so but the next two agenda items, uh, they are standing papers uh, that we do for the committee. Uh, the first, but uh, the both 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 the papers are for noting. Um, the first paper is just our financial update. So it's uh, an update on the first half of the year of the financial year. Um, and it covers off 
how we're performing operationally, um, and also uh, an update there with capital expenditure, debtors analysis, and our balance sheet. Um, and then obviously within the paper as well, has an in-depth commentary there of the CapEx projects and the grouping supporters as well. So taking the paper as read, um, and happy to take any questions. I've got one question from Bill. <laughs> Year to date financial overview, are the debt arrears higher than we'd expect for this time in the cycle? I think in your commentary later on, that's well covered. Yes, because yes, I'm just uh, yeah, I've got some additional comments. Yes, I can be okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I've got nothing further. What was the question? Sorry. Oh, it's just about whether the debt is at this time of the year and higher than what we'd expect from the cycle. But yes. a couple of questions oh, yes. down the debt, page 37. Yes. Just clarifying, uh, you're still in paragraph 21 talking about a pedestrian overpass. I think we've taken that out. Yeah. Um, well, it was a, was a different committee, it would have been. Action we uh, agreed to. Yeah, that's been removed. So we are keep, we are keeping the, the basic plan yeah. in place. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a quick question that done thing was probably maybe the wrong committee to ask, but the, the increase in co funding by QLDC, there's a couple of occasions here where we keep saying we increase the co funding of uh, the Alliance credit. Uh, what, what's the What's the um, basis for increasing the co funding? Is, there, is that because of change of the work program or something like that? Uh, well, that, I mean, it's part of the alliance structure, but yes, it'll be as additional costs, jobs, or costs or are added to the project. There'll be additional co funding from us as well as the alliance partners. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um. Uh, Uh, just in comment and sorry, page 39. Uh, under paragraph 36, Council in February we can discuss the deferral to be included. We haven't actually discussed any of that. No, we haven't reported back on that yet. Okay. Uh, we'll, right. we, we plan to report back on that now that we've got some more options for how we might deal with 516. That's just the timing thing. It's been a bit of publicity, though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it has, and I suppose it's that whole issue for us of having gone down the pathway as we've done our due diligence. We've now had to review what, what is the best recommendation we can make to council. In paragraph 37, we talk about 19.8 uh, million or 37 cent spent annual budget. Uh, um, do we talk anywhere about uh, what are we likely to achieve the full budget? Uh, um, I think we can, we're, um, we're well through the year. Yeah, so the updated forecast is around 40 million for the PMO. That's going to come to so an update for those budgets comes to council next week. Okay. So we go, that's what we forecast uh, for, um, just to update for where we think the spend is going to be. Which is, which is quite common. Yeah, if I can turn the graph, it explains that. But oh, I'll 47. We've got a projected out to the new. Oh, yeah. One okay. the same, yeah. There was some very good commentary through that. Yeah, it's a very detailed yeah. analysis of where we expect to be. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, there was just a question on, uh, sorry, I don't know, it's appropriate. The uh, Valentine Road Resale talks about uh, commitment of council commitment. I thought that was all under the contract, uh, was the Valentine Road ceiling group. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to find it. Uh, Para, yeah, yeah, paragraph 38. Yes. Valentine Road recently yeah, they with actual annual budget. I'm, I can't understand why there's any cost to council. Well, that's a contract that was, uh, I thought that was a, would have been covered under the contract. Yeah, there's an NZTA component. <coughs> I don't think it's 100% funded from NZTA. Oh, I Thank you. Thank you. I've got three. Yes. Yeah, um, so, just the first one on Kadrona water supply. Um, just looking at it's developer lead. Just wondering who um, has the risk of cost escalations under that development agreement. So, what was that again? Sorry, the, the, uh, for the Kadrona water supply oh, yes. development agreement, and that's yes. a developer lead piece of work. But I'm just wondering, just thinking of the risk of cost escalations, who does that 
sit with under the DA if it's developed lead? Um, I don't know the exact detail. provisions in terms of cost escalation, but yeah, primary just sits with the developer if we're paying some sum towards that. Yeah, project. So we've got to fix some. Yeah, we've got to fix some. Yeah. But, but I'm not sure whether there is an ability for the village to claim any escalation right. under the agreement. Okay. Just don't have that but it's Sorry, it's just been getting so close to the end. Just these little things are starting to make be more important, potentially. Um, the other one was around the um, debtors, just the development contribution um, debt um, in relation to the failure to release the titles. Yeah. Um, Is there, can you give us more information on Well, there was some comment on that in the paper about yes. the fact that whether that should have been booked at the time we booked. Is that yeah, that's, that's right. That's what's come down to. So, so you might have 12 top. months for defects. And so it sits on the debtor's ledger. Yeah. But in fact, you know it's not going to be collected until 12 months later. Right. So it's not a case of us pushing for title release. No, no. What I've, you know, I've looked into it and, um, we, for these developers, we invoice at the time of their application. So um, as the longer that takes, they're not be aged a bit more as well. So I'm just, I guess what I'm, where I'm, what I'm getting at is that tension between what finance wants and, and the work of, of the team doing due diligence on yeah. subdivision. Yeah, the, tr the yeah. triggers of payment, the triggers for payment are in the um, government act. So yeah. we can, um, the subdivision, we, can, we will, we will bill primarily at just before two before C, before titles are issued. So that's our main lever for getting them to pay is at, at title. Yes, exactly. I'm just I'm just concerned about that tension and, and are we doing the right thing by the works because there's that push to get titles issued at the Okay. Yeah, now something will work. The push will come from developer. So, I, I think, think that's a, a point of your making that you, you're concerned that we might be compromising our standards to get Correct. payments. No, or that actually the opposite happens. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're usually castigated for not uh, compromising. Yeah. That's how developers tend to see us. Um, uh, getting payment is a very secondary outcome Perfect. to actually getting the consents and the developments approved properly. Thank you, that was the insurance. So it's just a matter of how it gets in the system. Yeah. And just bearing in mind that the accounting treatment is different to the uh, with the concrete. Work, just yeah. the work, the way it works. Yeah. Sorry, and the last one, um, it was more of an overview question. It was just that there's a number of um, development agreements and contracts in place, thinking about Lakeview, Manawa, CIP funding, Kingston, Kadrona. Um, What's the risk that councillors don't understand those risks? And that is one of the risks in the risk register, triple zero four five. Is there a piece of work that we could do to make sure that the develop that the councillors sufficiently understand the relevant terms of the DAs and the risk that sits around those agreements? Because obviously we have limited debt available and it's getting more and more limited, and we're contractually obligated to do certain things. So when they're making decisions about other things. To have that in the back of their mind, I know it's in the back of this committee's mind. You, well, you've got the summary there, so as a councillor, yeah. you can read what's there. Um, what you can't have as councillors and trying to run aspects of the business. No, I'm just. It's it's more of an awareness when it comes around to long term plan decision making. When we're making yes. decisions on on capital, we need to understand the risk, the financial risk that's sitting in the background. Um, so that we don't end up breaching those limits. So I realise that I'm a councillor and I'm on this committee, but I'm yes. well aware that when I wasn't on this committee, I didn't go into the audit finance and risk reports and read through in detail. And so how do we summarise for the full council and make sure that they're aware of those key risks? I guess that's just... I suppose when we're putting the capital programme together, part of, the, part of that process is making sure that we... Uh, um, Honouring our obligations under various contracts, DAs will be part of that. So most of our obligation under DAs will be in the current program of Capital Works and are identified as such. So, so I think Nikki so, so yeah, so if like you if we were to sign up on with Manaman, we would see our obligations as as capital projects that are that are then brought to council. I guess maybe I don't make myself clear. Um, 
if we're making a decision to sell something like the minor team building, and do we give it additional funding, just as an example? We need to have in the back of our mind, when we're this close to our debt limits, the potential for something to go wrong. You know, where's the, there's, there's a lot of financial risk sitting in a bunch of projects. How do we ensure that all the councillors are aware of that when they make decisions? Does that make any sense to you? So I, 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 the, the, the principle of what you ask is, is correct, but I suppose the, the, I suppose the, the answer that, that, that I think is the correct answer is, um, you know, we, we do have a, a whole series of fiscal ratios which we're obliged to comply with and or, or declare if we're getting yeah. outside, of those. outside of those. Yeah. And so that, that's our first fundamental risk line of defence. Uh, to, to use, to probably use um, Gareth's <laughs> language wrongly, yeah. but, but I think equally, um, you know, we, we do have um, quarterly um, management reports about progress against uh, budget, budget and what our expenditure are, and we're required to operate um, a balanced budget. We also employ experts, uh, and particularly through Stuart and his team, to provide guidance and assurance that actually we are managing those risks and reporting those um, to council. So um, I think that, that I mean, the, the organisation is geared around not creating, putting ourselves into a place where we are exposed. Now, different councillors, different people have different levels of um, appetite for that, but I think fundamentally um, we have, we, we've established in the funding and finance policy what those fiscal thresholds are and we and we work within those. That's, yeah, that's how we operate. Sorry, it's just a case of the strength of governance of the organisation, that's where I'm coming from, and, and, and it is an identified risk, triple zero four yes. five. Yep. So I, I do think I'd like to see some analysis of that because it's very easy for us to continue to approve funding for various things on the basis that we assume that the organization has has those risks managed well um but as a governing body we shouldn't be assuming that we need to be on top of it so that's okay the, yeah okay well yeah um well, the analysis how is how those projects are reported on and what, what what information is put in front of us when we go to make an, the next decision um, yeah, that's the time you need to highlight uh, the risk. Well, if there's, any, risk yeah, if there's any um, issues in terms of cost overruns, it needs to be flagged. That's well, what you're saying. And that, well, that, that, that may impact on future decisions around extra expenditure exactly. if you are aware that there may be flags in the system. Well, you'll note that there is a yeah. separate dedicated report on Lakeview, for example. So that's something that has been requested and agrees. And that's a part of the governance of that project. That's on the agenda. So as and when those um, issues are, arise and the projects are of a necessary scale, but they do require supplementary reporting to what we would ordinarily do, then I think the executive is, you know, Quite able and willing to provide that information. Yeah. Um, yes. um, Lisa's got a question. Oh, Lisa, sorry. Thank you. Um, this may or may not be the place to ask this question, but it's just around looking at those operational risks and employee benefits. I'm just curious as to whether we um, provide or subsidise any housing or address the housing risk on our retention levels at all already or whether that's a risk that we acknowledge is making it challenging for us to both recruit and retain staff um perhaps i can answer that uh we, we made no provision for uh, housing um as such i mean we we have at times provided very very short-term relocation um funding for people moving but that's usually a matter of a week or so um and that's been part of contractual contracts where they've been required. Um, we, we've acknowledged housing as a, has been a risk uh, in terms of recruitment for, for council for or as long as I've been here and probably before that. It's particularly acute at the moment and we are very aware of that, um, but we've got no specific uh, policies that intervene in that space for, for our recruitment. We are very honest though with applicants about being very aware of how much it does cost and the shortage of housing. And again, we've done that as long as I've been part of this council. And probably before that as well, I would imagine. Yep. Thank you. 
Okay, any other questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, just um, an example on just a, a scenario on the risk of uh, to do with paragraph 45 is an example. Um, we've got confronted with a, I don't know the background, but I'm not trying to uh, witch hunt or but it's the, the financial risk of what gets sent through, what uh, uh, contractors are asked to do, and say, for a design. For example, we have a uh, we had a project here at a seven hundred thousand dollar budget, and we get a drawing come back for a two million dollar car park. And it's just understanding how how that would happen, and now we're going back asking them to do a drawing for a seven hundred thousand dollar or a bit of work. So it's just understanding the risk of what is going down the line from the staff to the contractors and the parameters put around it. Before we start spending really money on design, I just raise it as an example that it has come up, and there's all sorts of explanations of it during COVID and the whole of iterations and the stiff funding and things like that involved. But it's just uh, just trying to make sure that we keep on top of the risk of spending money, and then finding that what the consultants provide us is more than we can actually afford. Yeah. Mm. So, so it's whether the original budget was realistic. Well, yeah, and also what 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 uh, guidance was given from the, uh, I guess the from the elected members down to the, the staff, what what they had expected to see, and uh, if the funding was enough, then we'll come back and say, well, what can we get for that funding rather than just firing on ahead and heavy and open. Tell me, and where are we going to find another a million dollars for a project in this current climate? So is that that just that and the, just the work, at the working level, just making sure we, I guess, through with the risk policy, that that sort of thing will be covered. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're really trying to improve the way that projects are developed in, in house. And so, um, the way the 10 year planning previous years worked is that those first three years, and with the, each 10 year plan last three years, the first three years of budgets and projects um, should be as good as we can get them, and you know, preferably business case and, and a full estimate. Um, and you know, full design, and the and the projects in the years four to ten can be a little bit more indicative, and that's that's where we can get uh, deficiencies in terms of backup, and we're really looking to improve that process um, within the organisation so that we do have a good understanding of what what uh, information supports each project and what needs to be improved when because they do grow and they do change yeah. and there is funding that becomes available and uh, the rules around the use of the funding means you have to spend it and it can't be in yeah. the and all that sort of yeah. thing. So we need to be flexible, but I think- Yeah, there's something where they rather than just keep on with you and say, okay, stop, let's have a reconsider yeah. the whole project. So, so generally there needs to be you know, a good level stop of- Stop the stance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the other one is, and you do touched on it, um, and that is, um, I'm not sure how, how best to express that, but there's a degree to which um, we need to be careful about, um, I suppose, responding to continual requests to add a bit here, add a bit there. And uh, dare I say, a lot of that comes from politicians. Yeah, totally. um, and we need to perhaps push back earlier and say, actually, um, we only started with this budget. We're not going to be able to squeeze all those aspirations in. Uh, rather than getting to the very end of the process and suddenly discovering that the aspirations have turned the, the sandcastle into a full blown mansion. I totally agree. Uh, so I think that's what you're getting at. So yeah. acknowledge that. And, and it's partly the discipline of the organisation to come back and say, actually, that's getting well beyond our ability, you know, what, what you initially scoped out for something. Right. Okay, I'll move that we note the contents of the report. Thank you, all second. All those in favour? Aye. Jerry, thank you. Eddie, sense of expenditure. Carol, page 51. Thank you. So, um, it's also, this paper is also for noting. So, um, the report covers the first six months of the year. Um, paper is taken as read and there's no uh, discrepancy or anything like that. Right. Any questions at all? Or at all? Wayne. Just on, um, sorry, I'm just trying to what page we're on. Uh, 57, um, where it sets out 
um, various projects and whether they were on panel or off panel and what the procurement method was. Presumably off panel was, they're not part of a QS panel, it was just a direct appointment. Do we assess just thinking about procurement and the profile that's had in the media? Um, do we, as a part of this, take a look at um, those light and full um, procurement plans? Yeah. Um, is there any assessment of, of those, particularly the direct appointment of panel ones, just in terms of how they comply with the policy? Uh, there's nothing I'm aware of. It's just the Report. Such a the signing officer. I mean, no, none of those procurement plans can be can be implemented without one up one up sign off. So the rec and that's tied to our delegations. So if I'm signing off a, a procurement plan, I need to be comfortable that it is in line with policy. If it's not, I'll push it back. Yep. So there's no further reporting yet on the adequacy of, of the way we're following the policy in terms of how we're writing up those those plans and so on? Um, there, there, there's, well, I mean, there's a formal disclosure of those through this mechanism. Um, yeah. And, um, but interesting enough, I mean, I have, um, in fact, emailed Gareth and Stu and, uh, yesterday about what we need to do to ensure that managers are continuing to apply the policy, um, I suppose, vigorously and rigorously. So that's not to say there's any suggestion that they're not, um, but it's something that I've asked for um, us to sort of cast a, a, a more sort of, I suppose, vigorous eye over in the future. We will be in a position to do that more regularly once the system allows us to report more easily and we've got our procurement, dedicated procurement staff in place. We've got a vacancy for procurement manager, but we're waiting on the outcome of some strategy work to make sure we're, we're actually um, employing the right sort of person in order to move that strategy forward once it's once it's finalised. This is Stu, the timing and all the um, this, this, the, 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 the strategy work is sort of reached its conclusion. So as once once that's been agreed at various levels, we can we can move forward on that. So hopefully an appointment before the end of this financial year. That's an important one. Thank you. Okay. Well, you, you uh, move the note in your lip paper. Yeah, I'm happy to move. Okay. Absolutely. Little second. Thank you. All those in favour? All right. Carried. Thank you. So moving to health and safety, page 69. So, Katie. Um, no. So, um, not sure if everyone's met Katie. I'm the um, Human and Capabilities Director, so we'll just pick up there. Um, we just note the contents of the report, um, taking the report as read and open to any questions that we have any. Okay. Question. Oh, sorry. If, yes. if uh, Lisa, well, I've got one. From, I've got one from Bill. And Lisa's got a question as well. Oh, Lisa, right. Thank you. Um, look, just just really quickly, a concern about that aggressive behaviour. I'm, I'm interested in if there's any sort of patterns to that, or if there's a theme around it. Um, who who you're interested? Who sit on the receiving end of that? Um, yeah, I think it's the the main front of the cold banks, and we have pretty good parameters in place, and people feel comfortable reporting that kind of behaviour. Um, we've got some very supportive measures around um, with team check-ins and also with EAP as well. Is it anger at council generally? Is it is that is it that's what I'm getting at? Is, is what is, is there any indication of what the reason? All that aggression is, or is it case by case? People are under pressure on specific things, or is it a mm -hmm. council? Um, I think there is, uh, for example, recently case by case um, to this person, um, but <laughs> I think after COVID, 
big developer that could do this. Um, but we're, it, it's not just that type of thing. It could be, you know, uh, a parking fine. It could also be, we had one recently in the library and it was over, um, you know, the person unplugging computers to plug, you know, library computers to, to plug in their own equipment. And the uh, library customer said, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. And then the library, and then it kind of escalated from there. So there isn't really any uh, theme, you know, go back two mm. years, I could have said, oh, it's to do with um, the restrictions on COVID and all this type of thing. We were seeing that theme across the, the sort of, you know, sport and rec libraries, that type of thing. But at the moment, it's just, it is what it is sort of thing. You know? Thank you. Um, the other question is just um, with the graphs, um, it's great to see, but I'm just wondering if there's a way we could easily see trends. Okay. Um, that's all just, it would just be helpful to see what's changing. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Lisa. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions to Katie um, or clarifications around the key risks of public interaction in C. Um, are things like this, for example, our community associations, um, are, is there guidance within the constitution or so sort of coming from a new councillor perspective of how do we engage in a communication sense with the public around our expectations of how they conduct themselves towards perhaps other members within the community association groups or councillors and Probably the thing that flags that for me is this increasing level of organised public interaction where we may end up with opposing views within the public. Um, for example, um, in our public forum pre-council meeting, if we have people who are um, presenting positions on climate change and perhaps we're going to start to see pushback with climate denial, I'm um, just how do we traverse this emerging landscape where there's a lot more organized um, public position that may be polarized to other members within our groups um, and we've seen a little bit of this around facility use in Arrowtown and um, the library petition um, and other forums that are starting to become a little more topical. Thank you. Uh, Look, um, that's a re really good um, topic to raise, Lisa. It's um, something we're certainly um, very actively discussing. I think it's a matter of um, when we do come to um, undertake these uh, um, set pieces of um, consultation and engagement, we're more or less in a position where we need to have a little bit of a terms of reference, um, sort of setting out um, the behaviours that are above and below the line what will be tolerated and what won't. Noel's smiling at me because this is not a new issue. Um, <laughs> and I can remember being um, manhandled literally out of the Arrowtown Hall um, on the back of a um, camping ground consultation uh, with a whole lot of angry people yelling at us. And that was um, about 17 years ago. Um, but I do think we are very, uh, very aware that this is not a space that we're prepared to enable our staff to be in. Um, we care about our team, um, we have an obligation to them. So uh, it's about proactively having those conversations and anticipating um, that there might be some challenges. And you've only got to look to some of the public meetings that are happening up north to understand just um, how uh, passionate people can become and how challenging that is for, uh, for our staff. So yeah. heightened awareness, I think, uh, is definitely there. Katie, did you want to anything? Great, I think it's um, good to have those healthy boundaries and other terms of reference. Yes, and the staff safety is paramount. Yeah, yeah. yeah and Mr Chair, the only one quick experience too, the, who, uh, who was actually uh, chairing or trying to run those some of those sessions need to be quite clear up front. We talk about terms of reason, they got to be very clear up front how they want to run yes. and try and keep control. It's not always easy, but if you put some strong guidelines out to the community in, in those public meetings at the beginning and say this is what's what is tolerated, if you want to do something different, 
I think I think we do also think about when is it appropriate for us to utilize an independent facilitator. Yep. Now these independent facilitators um, now are actually trained in in um, you know, basically conflict behavioral. resolution yes, um, and behavioral management. Yes. So um, it is important sometimes that we identify that that is the right approach. Yes. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've got a question from Bill. Organizational health and safety, the incident with the contractor's subcontractor hitting an electrical cable is concerning. These types of incidents are recurring. At some point, there'll be a fatality if they keep occurring. Is it worth Mike and his team convening a meeting with contractors on this issue? I think it would it would mitigate a risk around WorkSafe investigation if there is a serious incident. By the way, Phil Park, CEO of WorkSafe, would be happy to meet key business stakeholders over breakfast, lunch, or dinner to discuss WorkSafe's approach to its role in support of improved business practice. So that's just something like that. We can certainly yeah. pick up that, but I think, um, I mean, yeah, we've had a couple of um, yes. various spiking related mm. instances, Alan, and we, this last one was thoroughly investigated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so that feedback's gone back, but we yeah. work outlining what was undertaken with this one. So um, the uh, Initial report from the contractor I thought was a bit weak, so we went back to them and basically said, you know, any underground strike we take as a serious occurrence, uh, and we need a more thorough report, which we did receive, which was very, it was a, an honest report, and um, they, they, you know, they did criticise themselves heavily. Uh, they also released a safety alert, which has gone around their whole operation. Um, covering these points that are listed here. Um, I had a meeting with the local um, office that were you know, doing the work and the health and safety people came down from Auckland and uh, we had a, a, a frank discussion around the expectations of um, the, um, well, any sort of work for council um, that um, you know, safety is our first um, objective. The other thing was, as you can see, this the, the local branch were not performing no. to their, you know, expectations. Uh, expectations. Yeah. And this is a it's a it's a nationwide contractor who do, does have all the systems in place. So it was a good wake up call for um, that sort of thing. We kind of found this in the past where we were not as sort of a series of incidents where we've actually involved the sort of head office and they've come down, done an investigation, and it's kind of, you know, this sort of um, bit hit and miss at times that, uh, um, you know, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing is uh, the, uh, you know, the, the standard that the head office should be working out and what have you. So it, it's um, each time we do have a strike, um, they are less than we were getting. Um, you, you know, I, I, we do go back to them to get, to, uh, you know, a full incident report and to make no bones about it that to whatever they've struck, we always look at it as the worst possible case, you know. So whether it's a, a small water lateral, to us it doesn't matter. It's, you know, you may as well have hit the main gas pipe. Must say though that the, this area does have a lot of underground services that they're not on plan, they're not, that, that they've not been buried properly, and even um, you know they they come out with a cat and Jenny and will try and locate and do the best, and um, e even to the point where we we reinforce with contractors that if if you've done all that you can. You might need a standover. Council will provide a standover if it's our asset for us. You know, we'll, we'll provide a standover. There's still the possibility that um, oh, no. they can strike them. Yeah. But what we're doing, is, what we're saying to them, is if you've gone to that length and you have the standover, it gets a bit more acceptable at that type of uh, thing. Whereas, as you can see with this incident. Nobody's pretty qualified. Really, nobody knew what was going on, and um, they just launched off. It's as simple as that, really. So. Well, something as Bill said to be mm. wary of mm. transitory nature of staff in this area as well. Yes, yeah. kind of transit yeah. staff. Yeah. 
I know just even in Auckland, it's just as bad. You know, we have um, strict health and safety inductions, yet people do stupid still, things. Still do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, around the electrical. And, and I think your point, um, Mr Chair, is, is that we, we are seeing a lot more, um, you know, contractors are struggling to get staff. Correct. Uh, often staff are not are coming on a very short notice, they're not always not getting the training, not, getting the yeah. training, not, not being encouraged to, to follow procedure. And um, so, you know, we, we just continue to reinforce that health and safety is the number one uh, requirement in all our contracts. Um, and, and that's, a, you know, that's an expectation that we, we have. So. But then, Mr Chair, the liability is lies with the contract. How much liability council? What if the, what if, like you say, Something's not on the as built, or is not aware of something there that causes some harm to a person. Where's the liability lie there? If, uh, if, if it's a council since the structure that's not identified, mm. it's, it's, it's not well, it's the site owner that's responsible, ultimately responsible. So the site owner mm. is oh. ultimately responsible. So that's why all the health and safety procedures that we have must be adhered to. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we, we can't be responsible for their non-performance because yeah. their health and safety requirements. That's why all our contracts are very um, mm. very specific in terms of what they should be doing. Yeah. We, we, we can't afford to be there 110% of the time. No. That's why we rely on good solid contracts. Yeah, it's an issue when the chair comes up with uh, like vehicles doing deliveries on the side of the road to building site or something like that if there's an incident and they haven't put in traffic management on the table. So. Um, yeah, so the, the whole thing about the you know, has happened very short, come up, deliver something, and then I don't know what happens if there's no traffic management in place and there's an incident. And it's on council land uh, or public land. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, it would be on the public track to they're responsible for traffic management. The contractor. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, the, if they had put in traffic management and we'd approved it and it wasn't adequate, then we would have some responsibility. But if they've not put any, you know, traffic management in that's required, then it's the contractor's responsibility. So it comes to the induction of the contractor mm -hmm. to make sure that they understand their obligations under what we require in health and safety. Yeah. So we all yeah. We, um, we we pre-qualify our contractors pre -qualify. so that we know that we're dealing when we have a, a, a minimum standard so that we know that they're capable of doing what they're saying they're doing. Um, when we're developing projects and things like that, the contract managers, project managers are working with them site-specific safety plans, task analysis and things. I'm often invited to, you know, cast my eye over or provide advice and what have you. So... Mistakes do happen, but we're, we're, the, the mitigation is that we are following the, the steps that sh we should be following under the legislation and the, you know, the good practice guidance works out the six step process. Yep. Thank you. Okay, we'll move that that um, paper be noted. Thank you, Nikki. All those in favour? Aye. Carrie, thank you. Now move to climate and biodiversity plans, page 80. So I would thank you for that, uh, Bill, Kirsty, Catherine, and Michelle. Um, just to introduce the team, um, as they have shown here to you as a group on business format, we will be bringing a regular STEM item to this forum around the climate and biodiversity plan programs. Um, the team is headed up by Bill Nicholl, who is our Resilience Client and Climate Action Manager, um, Avery supported by Kat Derman, who's Program Manager in this space, and Kirsty Pope, who's joined us online. And we'll uh, she's behind you. Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, online. <laughs> Big time. Kirsty is everyone. Kirsty is all things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All accounted for. Yes, yes. yes. So um, this is our first um, report to you where we're stepping into the um, forum of great GHG emissions reporting as well. So that this is a journey for us. And I will hand to Bill to provide a little more content. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, so this is a standing item, as we said, but uh, just a little bit of framing. We have, as Michelle mentions, provided a section on emissions reduction trending. So uh, this aligns with, I guess, the KPIs for the organisation, as well as some of the broader uh, commitments we've made with the current biodiversity plan. 
We've also provided uh, an update on the tracking progress of the climate and biodiversity plan overall. So as a portfolio of activity, uh, 70 actions in that three year lifespan of the plan. Um, so we we'll provide some key updates as well as a, an appendix that has some of the detail across all of the actions uh, that are underway. Uh, so forgive me for the small font size on that, but there is a yeah, lot of <laughs> it's been <laughs> fortunately hopefully you've got on the digital screen. Uh, so we'll be happy to discuss for any of that. Uh, and finally, there is just a, an update on the progress around the climate reference group, which is undergoing some restructure and also a new candidate selection process. Um, yeah, so, so there's more independence with the committee then. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the heavy paper paper is read, yeah. uh, and but open for the questions. Open to questions. No. Uh, just a just a general thing. I, when I first came out, I thought. Uh, so many uh, actions, so regular with the 70 odd finger and that. Are you comfortable with that? Or what I'm just getting at is that I've already <laughs> viewed that, uh, you know, for one year, you say, have one, a four page of actions, and you know, it's a dozen mm -hmm. actions to do them properly, but 70, mm -hmm. and I've been reading through a lot of it, uh, you know, they have started and sort of un to understand what that means by started mm -hmm. uh, and who's doing what. I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. How comfortable are you with the extent of what we've got on the table? Through the chair, having to respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good question, Lyle. I will attest to the fact that I feel a lot more comfortable in 70 than the over 600 actions yes. that were related as part of the development of the plan. So when we took this out, it was a 15 month or thereabouts kind of development program around it. So it did involve a lot of the, the feedback from the community and some matter experts. Um, so what we have there is, is it represents yeah, look, a challenging portfolio of work, but one that um, yeah, we were feeling we asked, you know, there was a lot of work to be done, but the, the, it was spread across quite a broad range of councils as well as external parties as well. Yeah. So there are specific actions that certainly our team are leading, but we're facilitating a lot of that to, to across different partners as well. Uh, but it does extend, you know, represent the broad scope of the challenge and particularly bringing the biodiversity elements into it, which were not there previously with the Climate Action Plan. So it's a whole new area of responsibility and accountability, but one that we are very pleased to be stepping up to the plate on. So the, the broad overview of progress with regards to 60, does it, uh, six to 54 actions that are currently yes. in progress. Yes. 62 aim to start this year. Um, so progress, good progress has been made. I'm happy to yeah, very good progress. Yeah. Yeah, Lisa. Thank you. Um, a couple of queries around the goals. Um, number one, where we're looking at our leadership. I'm curious around this enablement and acceleration of the green shift. I circulated to councillors and to Mike um, some work that had been shared with me from a colleague in Norway around particular models of climate conversations to try and harness the, the quieter voice in our communities, because we tend to hear from the small vocal minorities on the poles of a lot of these conversations, looking at new methodologies to enable our smaller um, groupings of citizens to come together in some sort of feedback channel to council. Um, and my other sort of observation on that is probably around goal four, our food resilience um, targeting. I'm just a little concerned that some, and this may be addressed in the actions, I haven't gone fully into those, um, but where it may butt up against our existing policies, we're seeing a huge shift from um, our heritage of being a rural agricultural and horticultural producing territory to being residential and lifestyle based living and we've lost a lot of our food production resilience through that and some of our policies for example not planting fruit trees or encouraging foraging on public land anymore um, I know Tiwa for example had a, a public burn that was designated for fruit planting and that I understand comes in conflict with some of our maintenance and Clark's policy where we are um, trying to avoid rodents or or droppage of fruit and that increasing maintenance costs. I just believe that these are areas that we should be perhaps ensuring our policies are consistent with and really being that leader in enabling and accelerating green shift and resilience within our communities. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Do I break that question into two? I'm just, I can certainly take my second part around food resilience. I think so that I haven't seen the paper from Lisa. No, I can pull that to you. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think it's worth noting that, um, Lisa, this was uh, passed in 2021. Is it the uh, last year. Yeah. Um, so it will be reviewed. The, the intent is for it to run for three years and then we'll be reviewing the goals and things. It's an incredibly fast moving space. So we're constantly trying to keep abreast of changing ways of thinking, new ways of doing. Um, so we're trying to keep really nimble and active. Um, so yes, the goals are relatively set at the moment and we're, we're just running towards them. We spent a lot of time preparing the plan. Now we're trying to spend a lot of time doing the plan. Yes. Um, but yes, I mean, any, any feedback and new ways of thinking in regards to that are really well appreciated. Thank you. And, and just through the chair, uh, there are, particularly for a green, green shift within council, um, council uh, Lisa, there's, there's a significant body of work around how we look at lifting carbon literacy, for example, of the organisation, how we embed climate change decision making right into all levels. Um, so there is, and, and, and the activation groups as well within councils that help support, uh, support the drive of that uh, cultural shift towards sustainability, climate action and biodiversity considerations. So th there is a, a bit of a program of work that we can provide more detail on. Uh, they are reflected in some of the actions that you'll see in the tracker there. Um, now, just with regards to food resilience, so we agree that this is actually a very key area, um, as we're seeing up north at the moment, yes. uh, the impact upon, I guess, future crops, future food production, but also the disruption to food, food, uh, food systems and logistics. Um, it's a very real risk. Um, so there is uh, actions in the plan that are currently progressing well. One is relates to 4.7 around the establishment or development of a local food network to look at food security, food resilience, understand the resourcing and the capacity we have at the moment and where the risks uh, and opportunities for development are. So that program, that particular project has been partnered with the local organisation, uh, well, over in um, Monica, yes. uh, and we're working towards a, a hill later this uh, in probably in the next couple of months, where we bring all of the food system stakeholders or representatives together, and particularly talk about the different the, the roadmap of initiatives we can um, uh, I guess invest in, including council policy around mm -hmm. urban planting, community gardens, and other kind of enabling type of policy work that council has the has an opportunity to support them. So, so there's some really exciting work happening in that space, as well as you know looking at considerations around, for example, the the um, Looking at uh, as part of the NPS and just thinking in terms of fertile grounds and, and understanding and how that is. those areas that need to be protected are well protected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see so much farming in New Zealand just being turned into subdivisions. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the latest NPS is starting to actually come from what provides some more forest right now. I think it, um, for me, it re emphasized in that um, first report our dynamic um, ability. Like, are we responding with the speed and agility that we'd suggest when we talk about ourselves being dynamic um, and as yet I think we're you know, it's happening so quickly all around the world that sharing is much best practice and really being um, early adopters of some of that um, because at the moment I think we do very well on our wine uptake during a few food crisis but perhaps not so well on our food items <laughs> You know, what are we producing here and, and ensuring those supply chains remain open? Yeah, thank you for that comment, for those comments. That's the Oh, yeah. Sorry, I've got, I've got four things. Four things. Okay. Yeah. Um, first one, look, thank you so much for um, the funding, Scott. I think it looks like we've prioritised the decision making and the tools that we're going to need for the long term plan so that we can make sure that that's considered. Do you think, to set the request for proposal process, um, do you think we're going to get um, the information that we need in time? And be able to use it to inform the RTP process. Very yeah. Sure. So we are on the way, well on the way with the process. We have a preferred tenderer. Um, we have a really good response to the RFP and we're really happy with that response. The preferred tenderer can deliver to the program that we have set out and has committed to that. Uh, the program we've set out has been. There's a uh, working group across council with uh, representatives, particularly from 
infrastructure, property and infrastructure and community services will be developing up the initiatives for the long-term plan, uh, who are across that work and um, are giving us confidence that it can be built into that plan. It will be an iterative process. We may not get it exactly where we want it for this LTP. That's the reality of it um, in terms of how we will develop this up with the with the consultant. Um, but we, we have that working group on board. We have the right people on board and buy in from across the business to make this work. Is there anything we can do to speed that up? And if the we and look, it's not a risk in the register that we don't meet our emissions and it probably should be. Um, and that probably needs to change. But I think yeah, it, yeah. Is it in there? I don't there is a penalised risk around not I guess fulfilling our climate response our response to the climate uh, emergency. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the sub detail really relates to I guess yeah, yeah. I'm just that, that's a big risk for me. I think mm -hmm. we need to stay on top of that one. Um, the second one is just around the charges. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously we put tweet in in conjunction with Millennium, but the the action is a plan, mm -hmm. and I'm just really conscious that if we don't get the charges in the right places where they're needed, that we're actually disincentivising people from using EVs in the district. So I think it's quite a risk. Um, so I'm just interested in, look, you don't need to necessarily speak to it, but I think we do need to focus on a plan of how many is needed and how do we understand how many are needed and where? But I just, oh yes, you know, you, sorry, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I responded to the chair, if you wish, just on it. So you look, I agree, so it was written as a plan, but um, for the broader uh, visibility of the group, so we, there is a program of work around looking at the comprehensive parking strategy as well as comprehensive plans uh, there's a piece of work that's underway at the moment that is that is incorporating EV, looking at EV, I guess, uh, requirements for the future. Um, what we're looking at this action we have in the plan around our EV charging strategy does straddle across the first two years of the plan. So we're looking to kind of, I guess, dovetail once that's so some clarity around that comprehensive parking strategy in place, how, I guess, an additional piece of work to look at that future of charging infrastructure, uh, what, what requirements are. It is an interesting space because it is market led moment with uh, Marie and being one of the bigger uh, recipients of the latest round of funding from ECA. So there is a kind of public, private, I guess, um, dance that is occurring around the deployment of this infrastructure across the country. So, uh, but understanding where we fit into it and how we can enable and support it is, is very yeah. important. Yeah. Thank you. Third question. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. The destination management plan is $50,000 worth of Funding. We obviously don't have a lot in that sort of pot. So, fifty thousand dollars for Project Nine, which before the foundational projects are achieved. So, I'm just interested in the thinking around that. Um, that we're not focusing on on getting the foundations right before we kick off on this Keystone Project Nine, which is important to moving. But um, cut before the horse reputational risk. Um, it's good, Jane. Uh, so effectively that 50,000 has gone into the um, maintaining momentum of Project 9. So what we heard loud and clear during the development of the destination management plan was don't sit on your hands and wait for the plan to be perfect before you start doing things. And we knew that there was an avenue there to kick down some Project 9 to build the data source that sits behind the interventions. So that is going on whilst the foundational projects are happening. So the project, the foundation itself is happening. It's just that's complications around governance and long-term funding, which are you know, we are beholden to some of the other you know, conversations that we're having at the same time. And um, meanwhile, you know, 3,600 days, whatever it is, counting down. So Project 9 has continued. Um, this is not, we learned that this 50,000 was a part of the co funding arrangement to get that initial scoping piece done, which is finishing this month. And we're seeking other avenues to secure longer term funding for that over the duration. It's not. Yeah. It was what I was interested in because you know, I'd really get the funding from our screen on our little climate yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a C investment into that space. I think it should be. Thank you. And final question um, just in terms of how the other, because obviously some of the actions sit with other departments, mm -hmm. how is, given the workforce constraints and so on, what are, I guess, what is the uptake? What is the buy on that you've had from other departments? And is there a risk around our workforce constraints and so on that some of those activities, which are quite major, mm -hmm. for example, the strategy and the policy team around the district plan, mm -hmm. that they don't get achieved? Is there a risk there? Can I speak to that just through the chair? I think it plays to the question earlier from Council Cox as well. So, yeah. look, it is, it is ambitious, and that was the outcome one, was that we, we wanted to uh, basically. Uh, 
particular weekend. I believe the uptake across the calendar all in terms of staff is, is, is very good. I think there is a uh, collective you know, support for what we're trying to achieve, but also an alignment of, of, in terms of broad outcomes. The work we are doing line, lines up very well with the spatial plan and the future development strategy. It aligns very well with traffic and you know, traffic management, you know, the future of transport, uh, and similarly into other areas like planning and development as well. So we are seeing almost you know, convergence of, you know, you know, people focused on, on on clear goals for the community that kind of line up very well under that climate biodiversity plan. Um, so there was certainly no resistance, uh, but there is a challenge yes, in terms of the of just the, the workload and impact load that we're all managing. Um, so it's right to raise that. Um, but we are looking at those avenues around the said partner partnerships and stuff to look at how we deploy these these, these key actions. Um, and just additionally, we do have some KPIs and corners of the organisation that are acting in the stick component of this as well. So we have a high uptake in terms of personal values and drive to do good work in the space, but then there are also some mechanisms to ensure that they're happy from a performance perspective. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Well, you get it. Oh, no, I'm just oh, going to eat and afraid about uh, charging stations. And the, 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 there's a lot of uh, public private stuff going on. So you see apparently you're going to roll out a whole lot of, uh, you know, and you go on the apps and look at how many are around now and uh, you can see the green ones which are available. So there's a fair bit happening in that space throughout the result. Uh, no, I think it's a good report. I, um, I just, uh, there's a few little, uh, in the detailed questions I might just email just for my purpose. There's nothing major just in, for my education, uh, but I'm happy to move the report if you don't. Okay. You'll second. All those in favour? Hi, Hi, Terry. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Move to page 103. I'd like to update. Um, Welcome, Paul. Stuart, Chair. Oh, yes. Good, thank you. You remember Are we underway? Yeah, yes. Okay, okay so. Um, this is the second report um, of the Lakeview update to the Audit Risk Committee. Um, I'll probably start off just doing a run through of the sort of changes yes. um, from this report, from the previous report. Um, the commentary in the, in the body of the report is broadly unchanged. Uh, we have moved some commentary in respect to the council resolution around the governance review and, and how this report came to this forum because um, it's established now on the, on the agenda. Um, and I can also note one of the resolutions around the developer um, having regular catch ups with all council. Um, we had a first meeting last month, I think it was, um, and we look to do that every six months as well. So Moving to table one, um, it's around the QODC obligations. Um, just an update here around the council works completion sunset day <clears throat> and the infrastructure works. Um, noting that uh, there is some phasing going on between other town centre projects and, and the Lakeview work, um, mainly in relation to traffic management. Um, so there may be some bonding of, of some of these sort of bit works um, needed to be done between, I guess, uh, the project team and our consenting team. Um, but otherwise, everything is progressing extremely well, and we want to make the point. Uh, table two, the developer obligations. I'm just highlighting here in that, in that first box. Developer has now um, received their fast track consent, um, and there has been an overall result, I guess, for them in terms of the reduction in building height. Um, and you would appreciate there are a number of things um, that they may choose to do with their development um, in response to that. Um, and we, as of prior to writing this report, but uh, recently, we did receive a modification notice from the developer and then we're working through that process of uh, assessing that, those modifications. Well, I'll just hold you there um, for Bill and Rand, who can't be here today. 
Um, it's a very good summary. What are the financial risks, if any, to QLDC of a missing process deadline? Financial risk? Yes. If any. Uh, of us missing our first, I guess, deadline here? Or? Well, I think it's the, um, the obligations we've got, the work processes he's talking about. So yeah, table if, one. if we don't meet the sun, sunset date, um, yes. the, the developer under the DA um, has the uh, right, I guess, to walk away from the deal. Okay. Um, they would receive their bond back, um, and we would be left with a you know, bit of land. A bit of land yes. with improvements. Um, we haven't transferred any titles, any, any titles or anything at this stage. No. Um, yeah. So, and we've been in good communication, both parties have been in good communication around the timing of those works. Um, so, it would be difficult for the developer to sort of um, try to re get any recompense or any, okay. any, any back from that. So, if, I think it's that's what the question was, if any. So, yeah, I think something. the risk around financial risk is, is we, you know, if, if things were to go away, and I think it's very unlikely that. The developer would walk away at this point, yeah. especially when we're talking maybe it's only a month or two. Yeah, um, yeah. Pretty long, long, did you? Oh, just to follow on with it. Yes. The key sunset date I assume we're talking about is the 30th of September 2023. Yes, we're going to have a little work done by then. Yeah. Um, actually, we're on track to have it done by around mid June. Mm. Um, so you're here but, time. Well, no, there's a there's a period where we have to go through our two two four requirements, our right. consenting to in order right. to actually get title. So yes. under the agreement, we should need to have title done by September. September. Not not actually um, just the works. Yep. 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 But I think I think that's um, just to follow on from Bill's question, um, Stuart. I mean that's something that we're constantly managing because yes. obviously. Um, when we meet our sunset date, then actually the risk transfers or the pressure transfers that the developer because it starts their timetabling for it triggers for the, their, their next yeah. obligation to us. So it's something that um, between Paul, PCG, and the Alliance, that's that's uh, who are delivering the project. That's a very actively managed. Yeah. So Jeff's on that. The uh, what that work? A lot of work. Going on up there, the, how, how are you managing the risk and the disruption to the uh, all the other businesses and that up there at the moment? Is that work you're going on? Right? How's that working? What businesses are you talking about? I don't know. I'm, 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 you're breaking speed. You don't I think, I think well, most, most of the work on Lakeview doesn't impact the. The brick and street work is basically work around the town centre master plan. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, because because Lakeview effectively is an isolated site, so it's it's not actually having a direct impact on any other operation. In fact, no. in fact, there's some benefits from having Lakeview up there, up there yes. because it, because it provides an extra capacity for car parking and a few other things. Okay, okay. No, I thought it was some of the infrastructure works on the roads leading up to there. Yeah, maybe and, I'm wrong. Okay. As Mike said, those are other can't see them up and we've effectively got a, a greenfield site. The main park's still operating though, but there's a green one. Yeah, there's a con yeah, they're they're holding over on some blocks of land so they maintain some of their operation. Sorry, what we interrupt. That's all right. Um table two, I guess just highlighting um that consent's come through, the modification. Um and I think I've just changed there. The, the developer has indicated um, under their satisfaction of the settlement conditions um, and in this commencement of the stage one substantive construction, um, those other boxes there, um, they've indicated to us that they'll be expected to start sort of around this time next year. But um, as Mike pointed out, subject to us finishing out and doing our work, which is, which is good. Um, but again, the moderate risk rating on that relates to our moderate risk. Yes. Around us completing our output. Um, now, our previous elected member, um, and I, I believe he's still a member of this, this group, uh, Keith Copeland. Yes. Um, there was an action from the last meeting. Um, he wanted to have some financial data. Um, 
and available financial data included. So there's um, the summary in table three and table four of, yes. kind of what, what we're calling the transaction costs. It's broader than just the delivery of the infrastructure as it sort of provides an overall um, figure of, of, of where things sit in terms of the transaction costs. Um, and it's not much else there. If you go to the last appendix, I think there's some updates to table five, um, pending current modifications for the very documents, but I've already described it in the commentary there around um, the decision there around the developer's modification and, and how we may um, prove it to be very good and look through that. Okay. There's a process underway at the moment. Sure. Any, any questions? Any questions? Thank you. I'm just wondering, did the, the developer um, engage with us on design papers through that fast track process? So, sort of in response to the panel, they've made changes. Were, were we kind of kept in the loop through that process? Or not? Just wondering. Uh, formally through the uh, modification process, so the, the, the notes. So no, prior to that, so obviously the, the panel was seeking changes and they were making modifications and then they came out with a consent. So were we involved and did we have some oversight and did they come to us proactively and say, look, we need to meet these parameters, so this is what we're thinking of doing through that consenting process? Not formally, no. But there was some engagement. I mean, we continue with our we, we have regular um, monthly what we call developer project control group meetings. Um, the developer and us have obligations to keep either party informed at a project level of what's going on. So that, yeah, of course they they provide some insight along that. But we haven't received a formal notification until last month. Yeah. Um, so I suppose to this to that point. I mean, effectively, what the what the EPA determined was a reduction in height. Um, and I suppose, I mean, the, the modification process is the process by which they come to us and say, this is how we think we're going to respond to the circumstances we found ourselves in, or the, to the decision that was raised. Right. Yeah. And, and, and maybe, of course, the, um, the consenting team were involved in that process, but separate to us as development partner. Um, they were yeah. involved. Yeah, just because obviously they got a consent to. And they plan a particular plan that they you know have a consent for that they can't they could seek a variation i suppose but mm. they need to implement that i'm just interested in, in the extent to which they keep this involved because now we're sitting with a modification that may or may not be material after the fact and it just the process is interesting to me because obviously we're going to have to go through it multiple i don't think the time. sorry I'm that's, I'm misinterpreting the question, but I don't think the consent is that specific. The consent effectively creates a framework for them to operate and what they're coming back to us as the modification processes, how they will meet our the master development plan and the DA performance outcomes within the framework yeah. that the consent so sets. So there's significant flexibility still within the consent? The, as far as yes, because of the fundamental change to the consent was around the amount of the volume of height that was given. I'm not sure there were other specific methods, actual specific consent conditions that were issued as a result of that consent. Yeah, it's always plan that's consented. Yeah, I think maybe I mean it's part of the iterative process here. I guess us as development partner in this um, have an option to influence the outcomes of, of that based on on plan if. If the developer's gone to the consenting authority and they now have a consent to work with, um, and if we're not um, comfortable with that, um, we could talk to the developer about an approach which may or may not require further um, consent variations. I mean, it would be a big call for us to sort of say, actually, we'd like additional height or something like that, um, and then for them to go back. So, yeah. yeah, I think we're trying to be relatively hands off in terms of those things. Yeah, I'll have a look at the consent. The other question that I had was just around um, this bonding that you're speaking of. So, it's, it looks like we're, um, we can finish works, that's all going to be done, mm -hmm. um, but there's a process to go through that you're suggesting might not be complete by the, 
by the sunset date. I'm just wondering why we're looking at bonding. Yeah, because it, I mean, again, this has really been run by the infrastructure team. Yeah. But my <coughs> understanding is there's a wastewater pipe that's to go down Main Street, um, which is a requirement for the subdivision. Uh, but also, it's been um, it's, it's part of the we call the trunk infrastructure as well. It's, could you explain a little bit more about that? So you're saying we can't like we can't get tight until that's done. Um, well, so as part of our consent requirement, we have to put in a stormwater, uh, sorry, wastewater pipe, yeah. which, which runs down Main Street. So, so is that going to be completed? Does that part of the sunset? Does that need to be done by the sunset stage or not? Well, in order to get title, we need to complete the subdivision so use. So you've got to combine that so you, service. Yeah, so what, I mean, you're saying everything's going to be finished by June, except that. So what we've been told, the project team has been told by the infrastructure team, is that those works, um, because of some alignment with other work, may not be completed by June, and maybe more towards September. So what we would do in that case, and it's pretty normal practice, is we would approach the consenting team, the RM engineering team, and say, hey, these works are looking done. Can we get title at this point? Um, and they we get bonded to before final title gets so basically what, what, what we're doing to ourselves is what we often do to develop to developers here so yeah. there'll be a piece of work that's underway it will be delivered um it's just the time it's a timing yeah. issue and so effectively what we do externally is we say uh we will bond you to complete this work and therefore because we've got the confidence that that work will be completed we will sign on 224c so that happens on a fairly regular basis and it's just the mechanics of the marketplace. And, and so what we're doing is we're doing that to ourselves effectively. We're saying we've got a piece of work that because of some uh, dependencies outside the system, we don't think it's either can be delivered or is the most effectively delivered inside the time frame. So we will seek a bond from another part of council to that we guarantee that we will deliver it. Yeah, and the process behind that is we would then go to Lens. Yeah. With the 224 sign on, subject to that bond, and we could get title issued. Now, if there's still requirements to have, say, the wastewater pipe done um, prior to the issuing of that title, um, then there would probably be a caveat put on the pipe saying that that's the need to be done before any name is considered. So, through the chair, is that, that piece of work is fully funded and not at risk in any way? Correct. Okay. Any further questions? If not, I'll move that that uh, we note the contents of the report. I'll your second. I'll second. All those in favour? Aye. Carried. And I'll now move that we move into public excluders. Got a second for that, Nicky? All those in favour? Aye. 